I am delighted to be with you today, to be able to come and share with you. I was excited when uh, Pastor Tom and, and Alec uh, asked me to come and, and share the word, and I was even more excited, or no, I was more scared when I found out when they said, no, we don't usually have outside speakers. We usually have people from within the congregation or within our staff do this, so I felt like um, I was either, I felt like I was asked to come to evangelize to the Methodists, but, <laughs> but actually, to tell you the truth, I'm actually here to be evangelized too, so you can convert me, because there's a great spirit in this room, and it, it wouldn't take much to turn, okay, so <laughs> I'm just telling you, it is a good thing, and, and it is a power, I hope you know what a great young man of faith you have here, serving you, and my only complaint is that he didn't invite me to come here until after I was no longer able to give him a grade, so... <laughs> Our scripture reading today comes from the book of Exodus. Uh, you may or may not find this uh, kind of a familiar story as Moses comes and has his um, life-changing encounter with God. So listen now to the word of God as I share with you uh, from the third chapter of Exodus. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the far side of the desert and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight, why the bush does not burn up. When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush. Moses, Moses. And Moses said, Here I am. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the home of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now, go, I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And God said, I will be with you, and this will be the sign to you that is I who sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. Moses said to God, Suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me. And they ask me, What is his name? Then what shall I tell them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, Say to the Israelites, the, God, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is his name forever, the name by which I am to be remembered from generation to generation. Here ends this reading from God's holy word. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the blessing that it gives to us and the hope that it offers. But Lord, help us not to be confused. Help us not to think that these are simply words on a page written for people long ago and far away. We know these are your word for us this day. Open our hearts to your message and our lives to your purpose. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. There was this pastor who liked to go out and play golf. I know your pastor doesn't do that. But he liked to go out and play golf, but he wasn't very good. And he always had trouble when he got to the 14th hole because he always hit it in the water. And one day he got around to that hole and he looked at that water and he said, you know, I am just tired of this. 
and he picked up his new ball and he put it in his bag and he got an old cut up ball, one that wasn't going to cost him any money, and he put it down and then he went and he addressed the ball. And as he addressed the ball, he heard a voice from on high say, use the new ball. So he looked around and not being one to second guess God, he took the new ball out of the bag, picked up the old ball, put the new ball down, and he went up to address the ball, and just as he got ready to swing, he heard a voice from on high say, take a practice swing. So the, man ste the pastor stepped back, and he took a practice swing, and then he stepped up and addressed the ball, ready to hit it, and he heard a voice from on high say, use the old ball. <laughs> this is how it is sometimes. When we try to figure out what God has planned for us, we're not always sure. I live on a hill. I live on a very big hill. It, it's, it's not the kind of place where you would expect there to be a flood. But, but we learned something otherwise about four years ago. If you remember that fateful day when we had about 15 inches of rain in this town, and we learned that we indeed can get water, we can get a flood in our house even way up on the hill, higher than Noah would have even known. And it started kind of slowly. We were in the middle of a tornado warning already. And so we were all down in my daughter's bedroom in the basement. She was thrilled that we were all down there, by the way. And, and suddenly we saw, I saw a trickle of water come from underneath the TV. And so I jumped up and ran in the garage. And in the time it took me to go to the garage and get the wet vac, that trickle turned into a river. And, and then that river was met by a stream coming from the other direction. And then it was met by more water coming in the basement window from the other direction. And all that water flowed together in my basement. And it all gathered in the low spot, which happened to be right at the bottom of the basement stairs. And so that's where I made my stand. So, so with wet vac in hand, I want you to picture this. I'm standing ankle deep in water with an electric appliance. <laughs> and, and I began this futile attempt to stem the tide. I'm trying to suck this stuff up but it's coming in faster than I can get rid of it. And literally, I'm filling an eight-gallon vacuum every 40 seconds. We timed this. And, and so then I would have to unplug and run the contents and dump the contents out and plug back in. And, and we did this for a long time. And finally, my family took pity on me. And we formed this little bucket brigade where we kind of tried to get the water out. And it worked pretty well. And about 11 o'clock, some friends came over and started with their wet vacs. And they started to help. And it was like a party except it was very wet. And, and we were starting to gain on it, but it was still raining very hard outside. And, and, and I was starting to see dry floor, so I was getting encouraged. And so we are vacuuming, and we are making progress, and I'm having good thoughts, not saying anything bad. And, and then the storm hits its climax about midnight, and it's thundering and lightning, and the rain is just pouring outside. And so with the rain outside coming down in torrents and the lightning flashing furiously, the power went out. And, and our wet vacs were rendered useless at this point. And, and in just a matter of a couple of minutes, the basement just filled up with water again. And, and all of that work, all of that work was just like, and it seemed that it was for nothing. And, and we just felt like giving up. But, but we couldn't. It was our house. You know, we wanted to make it, make it safe. We wanted to reclaim it. So it was dark and it was wet. And we didn't know what to do. So we did something that didn't make any sense at all. But we started bailing by hand. Just started bailing with buckets. Just started, and it was a slow process. And it was tiring. And it, it seemed futile. But, but given the circumstances, it was the only thing that we could do. And we bailed by hand for about 30 minutes until finally the power came back on. And, and it hadn't felt like we had made much progress along the way, but, but in the end, it really did make a difference. And on the one hand, bailing by hand seemed like a futile effort against all that water, but, but we did what we could do at the moment. And by 6.30 the next morning, the water finally stopped coming in, the damage was minimized, and the cleanup started. Now, why do I bother to tell you a bunch of new friends about the state of my basement on that night. 
because it dawned on me that, that standing there, knee deep in water in the pitch black darkness with the rain coming down outside and the lightning flashing furiously and the water pouring into my house, it suddenly struck me that this was the perfect illustration for our lives of faith. And even more important, it may be a very good illustration about the state of the church today. Now, I don't know if you've noticed, but, but the world is changing all around us. It is changing fast, perhaps at a faster rate than ever before. I mean, society is going through growing pains that are unprecedented. And the government is struggling with issues that just a few years ago we would have taken for granted. And the church, which was once foundational to every community, once seen as an asset for all the people, even non-believers, once taken for granted as the, one of the pillars of our society, of our culture itself, the church is experiencing an identity crisis. The church, the epitome of, of all that is solid and foundational and permanent, looks a bit like me standing in the dark up to my knees in water. We, we know that we need to move ahead. We know that some changes are inevitable. But our vision for the future, and even for our own lives itself, it's largely unmapped. We're not quite sure what comes next. It's not that Christ is less important to us. It's, it's not that we're out of opportunities for mission and service. It's, it's not that we lack men and women of faith. But in this changing culture, so many things are out of our control. And there are times when in spite of the best of our efforts, it doesn't seem like we're making a dent in the things that we're called to do. And too often it seems that we have lost the distinctness of our identity, of our voice, amidst, amidst the, the cacophony of messages and voices that come from the culture around us. And, and as we struggle as a church to find ways to be relevant to that culture, to be attractive to a larger and larger group of unchurched people, that voice becomes less and less distinct. And in the midst of that confusion of identity and purpose, sometimes all we can do is just keep on bailing. The truth is, the truth is I have lost my church. I have lost my church. It, I'm not saying that that's good or bad, but, but the church that I was called to so many years ago, it, it doesn't exist anymore. It, it seems like I need to take a refresher course in Presbyterian 101 every couple of years because I don't know what's going on in the, in the denomination. But really, very little is the same. You know, the polity has changed, the people have changed, um, the way we do things has changed. Um, when I go back to this presbytery that I belonged to for 30 years, I don't know half the people and they don't know me. When I get newsletters from my former congregations, and I, there, there's more and more names that I don't recognize and, and names that don't remember me as their pastor. And, and quite frankly, that's, that's a little bit disoriented and, and a little bit disconcerting. But you know what? It's a feeling that Moses knew very well. Think about this passage that we just read from Exodus 3. Here's Moses. He, he is set in his life. He is comfortable in what he's doing. He has established a life here in this place his job is to tend the family flock. That's what he does. He lives in this place assured that his family is settled. I mean, his father-in-law is the priest. He's a person of some standing. And there's an order to his life of sorts. And he's out one day just doing his job, minding his business, tending his flock, and he turns the corner and he comes face to face with God. And everything changes. Because God has a plan for him. God has a calling for him. He wants to send him to Dubuque, I, I mean, to, to Egypt. He wants him to leave all of those comfortable ties behind, and he wants him to begin a new life, a life led by God, a job that's, that's brand new to him, and one that is way out of his comfort zone. And Moses responds the same way that any confident, self-assured Christian would respond. He says, are you kidding me? 
I mean, this is no Charlton Heston Moses. This is more like a Woody Allen Moses. I mean, who me? Are you talking to me? Who am I that I should do this thing? I can't do it. And God isn't buying any of it. He simply says, I will be with you. I will be with you. It's a lot like our lives of faith. I mean, you might be one who has a plan for your life. You may have everything planned out. You may know what you're going to do occupationally and spiritually and and as a family person, and that's good for you. I'm glad you anticipate the future. But the trouble is, neither life nor the Lord seem to feel obligated to follow your plan. And there are times when we get those unanticipated twists and turns and confusing times, and we don't know what to do. And all we have to remember is that the Lord says, I will be with you. The truth is, most of us don't like change very much. And most of us don't feel comfortable with uncertainty. But think about Moses. When God called him to set his face toward Egypt, he wasn't saying, Moses, let's go do this temporary job and you can come back to your life the way it was. It was a life-changing move for him. I mean, back in that day, if you moved any distance, it meant you were going for good. And it was a call that would change his life, and it would change the lives of those people that he was called to serve. And he would not witness most of it with his own eyes. He would not see the fruit of his efforts. But he went. He took that leap of faith. He walked that walk that God wanted him to take with only the encouragement and presence of God to show him the way. Friends, your commitment today, your your call today is no different. You may never call yourself a pastor, but you are nonetheless a servant of God. You are called by God to live life as a person of faith. And no one knows what your future will bring. No one knows what you will do or where you will live or, or who you will meet. And sometimes it may be a bit unsettling. But no matter what God throws our way, regardless of the uncertainty that we face, we still have this all-encompassing presence of the Lord to offer us encouragement. Like Moses, no matter what we encounter from this point on, our life will never be the same. This is just a part of that ongoing process of service and devotion and faith. The problem is, when we get out there, when we get out there to to do that work that God has called us to do, when we're ready to put it all into action, we may not recognize what the church looks like out there. But we may find that the church that we've always known has twisted a bit and looks different than we remember. And that's okay. You know, for many years, the culture was on a similar, if not parallel, path to the church. We kind of moved along in this this rather symbiotic relationship where where the culture kind of reflected what the church said. But that time has passed. In in many ways, the culture has now taken a different path. Who knows why? You know, maybe people are more independent today or or maybe they've learned to put themselves before other things or or maybe we as a church just haven't done a very good job of, of saying what we believe and what the word is all about. I don't know. But in any case, as the culture takes another path, We need to make a decision. And the decision is, how do we now best intersect with that culture? How can we have an impact on the lives of the people we are called to know and nurture and nourish? What do we do to reflect the gospel in our daily lives when things out there don't always go the way we like? You know, instead of being in sync with culture, and having the culture accept what we do and say, now we have to figure out how the church is missional, how we we live out that mission out there in different ways. But the problem is, the problem is, is that no matter what you think about the changes in that culture, no matter where you are politically or spiritually, no matter what you think about what's happening out there, the truth is, is that we have one thing as our guide. And that is the Word of God. It is our foundation. It is the basis of our principles. And it is the source of our unity as people of faith. And it is our responsibility to follow that Word. 
and to not allow it to become a book of suggestions, but to continue to know that God's word is a guide for our lives. So what do you do now? You do the same thing that Moses did. You continue that journey that God has set you on. You take that next step of learning and growing and maturing in your faith, all under the watchful eye of a God that really cares about you. And you remember to maintain those foundations that brought you here in the first place. Jesus is our Savior. The Bible is God's Word. Salvation is God's gift. And the church is simply a tool for living out God's love. You know, of all the people that you know here in this community, of all the people you like, of all the people here that have impacted your life, including your pastor, nothing will impact your life or your journey or your success as a person of faith more than your relationship with the one who set you on this road in the first place. Remember him. Lean on him. Pray to him. Depend on him in every circumstance, both difficult and joyful. For nothing is more essential to finding our church than Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. He is why we are here. He is what we are about. And he is the one who will lead us through to the end, even when we don't know what the next step will bring. Friends, no matter what life may bring your way, I would encourage you to keep that call from Christ first and foremost in your mind. Knowing that that come rain or flood, beyond the bailing is a Savior who lovingly encourages us on. And I hope like Moses, you will discover in this church his vision for you and his way of life that he wants you to follow, a way of life lived in the loving arms of an ever-watchful, ever-caring God. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we are thankful for your presence in our lives. We don't always know what to say or what to do, but we know that you will guide us like you guided Moses. Lord God, when we look out at this world that we live in, we we marvel at the beauty of it. We look at the the, the vastness of your creation, and we, we wonder at the fact that the creator of the heavens and the earth cares about us and our individual lives and the things that we do and the problems that we have. And we pray, O Lord, that that we can continue to be in relationship with you. Lord, today we look overseas, we see people with problems that, that are so hard for us to relate to. We see places where men and women live lives of oppression. We see places where death and killing are a way of solving problems. We see countries where poverty and hunger are a daily way of life. And we wonder why. And we wonder what we can do. Help us to reach out in your name and help us to pray for your help. Lord God, closer to home, we know the problems don't go away. We know that we have concerns and issues and things that we deal with that we shouldn't ignore. We pray for those who have difficulties in their relationships. We pray for those who are having financial problems. We pray for those who are having problems in their relationships. We pray for those who struggle with addictions and other concerns in their lives. And we pray for ourselves as we try to live each and every day that we can be faithful no matter what voices we might hear. Lord God, guide us now in our lives together and show us how to be your children. Show us our unity now as we pray together that prayer which Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.